One of the things I would like to do is to focus on our time, this time, as evident of the, the shift point in the halfway Earth evolution, of human evolution on Earth, in order to suggest that this is, we're sort of straddling the fence between the first half and the second half of evolution on Earth. In the first half, by and large, our primary task was to read the teleprompter, follow the cue cards of nature within which the blueprints of the gods were embedded with the help of some parental sovereign leaders as a dreaming, sleeping, sub-sovereign, group soul, children of humanity. This is all changing now, and with our enthusiasm and hubris of the rationalistic enlightenment period, which Goethe sort of disparaging, disparagingly called a revolution in a piss pot, a revolution in a potty pen, much ado about something, almost nothing, uh, we started to presume or assume that with the full development of the intellect, we had everything we needed to qualify ourselves for the first time as junior or incipient creator beings. And consequently, we are surrounded by the creations of the intellect, the synthesis of nature as an intellectual second nature. Uh, and it's rapidly becoming obvious that we need something more than the intellect to become creator beings. Uh, it's, we're more or less in the position of the rock star who trashed the hotel room after the concert. It was a good idea at the time, but now the bills come in. And we have to add the spiritual training, understanding the communication and participation in spiritual worlds in order to work as creator beings or co-creators with matter. In esotericism, in Western esotericism, the first half of the Earth evolution is called the Mars Earth phase. The second half is called the Mercury phase. So in the Mars phase, we have the descending arc of spirit entering matter, sometimes called the fall. And it, uh, it requires making space in matter for spirit. And we have to use our elbows and knees, fight for the space, plant a flag at the top of the hill. It requires the Mars forces and passion and glue. And so in the first half of human evolution, we have hard wrought, step by step, solid ground to stand on, institutions that back us up, cultural integration and expectations that support us. And now all that's evaporating. All of that is going to the wind and the mercury phase is the alchemical phase. Everything that's been glued together in the first half of human evolution on the recovery ascent to the descent of spirit and matter in raising matter up to spirit, we have to unglue everything that has been bound and glued. And in this straddling the fence position, we're in the midst of sort of stepping in a, a psycho-spiritual quicksand as regards matter. Uh, there's very little we can rely on. The nuclear family is almost gone, disappearing. There, there's what we expected to support us community-wise, culturally, is evaporating. A lot of what we call community is bureaucratic on, and on paper. And so we, we don't have 
the full forces of the I, the I am that I am, for individuality and freedom, and moving ahead, and we've lost most of the old community that has supported us up until now. And one of the signatures that is, I feel, very much a part of this experience as we're trying to redefine ourselves, transform ourselves, meet the challenges of the time, is um, once every 130 years, or 113 years, variable, there's a double eclipse of Venus with the Sun, called a double transit of the Sun. Uh, it, it serves, it, it, between the two, it develops an eight-year plateau between the two eclipses. And this eight-year plateau is a very germinal period for the initiatives in black and white magic that take the next century to unfold. This, um, this transit that's occurring now began in the summer of 2004, and it culminates in the summer of 2012. The great Mayan 13 Bakhtun calendar, which is much touted these days, uh, began at about the time Kali Yuga began, about 3100 BC, even though as far as anthropology and archaeology is concerned, there was no Mayan culture existent at that time. And it started on a double Venus transit of the sun, and it ends on a Venus transit of the sun. The Mesoamerican culture timed and tuned all of their calendar culture cycle on Venus, the Miztec, the Olmec, the Aztec, uh, all of them. And part of the downfall of the Mesoamerican culture was connected with the decadent Venus mysteries. Now, what I'd like to do is go back to the last one as a point of reference which was 1874 to 1882, with an eight-year span in between. And what happened during that time period was more or less the genie got out of the bottle. Uh, there was... Um, You had Blavatsky coming over to New York and meeting Olcott. Manfred Schmidt-Rabant claims that she was directly, they were both directly under the tutelage of Christian Rosenkreutz for three years. And then starting the Theosophical Society. Now at the same time, Walt Whitman, or... Uh, Emerson. Yeah, Ralph Waldo Emerson his legacy had been picked up by Bronson Alcott and formed into the Concord School of Summer Philosophy for 10 years. And that was a tremendous Renaissance influence which affected European philosophy across the sea. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy sent her initial manuscript to be proofread by Bronson Elcott to see what he thought about it. Uh, what, to my mind, was going on during that period was that in the Council of 869 in Constantinople, with the church, spirit was banned. In the 11th canon of that council, they basically said, you may have body and soul, but spirit is to be a, uh, 
if you do use it, it has to be theoretical, abstract, symbolic, or metaphorical. If you treat it as an autonomous real-time function, you're out. You cannot be in here. It was technically over uh, a debate argument with a character named Photius, and the church claimed he was trying to produce a dual soul. But the issue is much larger behind that. And that was the permanent separation of the Eastern and Western Church from, that po from the point of that council. The Eastern Church took spirit and guarded it, developed it, and in the Western Church it became a heresy. Uh, and then shortly afterward, you had, especially around the 12th, 10th, 12th century, you had the tremendous emergence of dualism. You, you eliminated the Trinity, and you lapsed into dualism, the, the heaven and hell vertical dualism, and you had to pay your tithe and cover your bets in the mutable soul realm. That, that was not guaranteed. Uh, then after that vertical dualism caught between heaven and hell, the scientific movement developed around the 14th century, and they, they slipped. They said, we're too smart for this stuff. We're not going to fall for this. But they created a, a horizontal dualism, the Cartesian split the inner phenomena, the outer phenomena, nothing in between. The legacy of which we're still surrounded by today. Uh, and then, in this double Venus transit of 1874 to 1882, one of the things that happened was Wilhelm Wundt of the Leipzig School, who established the first experimental psychology laboratory in the world declared in, I think, 1878 or 1879, right in the middle of that period, the, the human is a sophisticated animal. Shortly after De La Matrie in France had said the human is an, is an exotic machine. And Pavlov had been writing letters to contemporaries saying this term soul, this ambient, unqualified term soul, which is still lingering around the edges of science, science makes a mess all over the lab table. We've got to get rid of it. We've got to clean up. We've got to get focused here. And Wundt was the one who actually did it. And so he did to the soul what the Council of 869 did to the spirit. He said, if you treat the soul as an autonomous real-time function, you'll be out. You are not progressive. You are not in the scientific circle. You won't be quoted or cited. Uh, and he said, if you treat the soul, it's not helpful. But if you do, it's got to be theoretic, symbolic, metaphoric. And in actual science application, only in biofeedback experiment. Blood rate, heart rate, that sort of a thing. Uh, and so that, that set the stage for the 20th century as far as the attack on the reduction and min minimalization of the soul. A lot of people, if you talk to them today, who are Baptist or Catholic or various forms of Christian, and even in other areas, if you ask them, what is the soul, qualify it for me, describe what constitutes soulness, that, and especially what would be the distinction between soul and spirit, you, they are generally at a loss for an answer.